Well, welcome everybody to our Lenten service tonight. Uh, obviously, this is a little different. My name is Pastor Dan Petrock, uh, Associate Pastor here at Living Faith. Uh, didn't think I'd be up here doing it this way, but uh, excited that we saw the opportunity uh, to just gather, um, pray together, confession and forgiveness, and hear a short message about uh, on our sermon series, Body Basics. I'm building off Luke's sermon from last Sunday. He used the idea of how uh, our feet are part of our listening. We've talked about our hands, we've talked about our, our eyes and facing forward and uh, our ears. And now we're, we're, we're how do our feet um, dictate how we're gonna listen? And then obviously on the walk. Uh, our text tonight is the text from Luke 15, the prodigal son. And so all I'm gonna do is uh, go forward. We're gonna do just some opening prayers. Uh, then we'll do a confession of forgiveness. Uh, we'll do the reading, and then we'll have a short sermon. So will you join me in a word of prayer? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, we come before you tonight to lift you up in prayer and praise. The beautiful thing is your church eternal is not a building. It's a church of people. And we thank you so much for the opportunity that no matter where we're at, you have joined us together. You have made us your children and part of your family. Your church on earth is the beacon of light to the world. And in this time of pandemic and uncertain times, I'm thankful that, that we have a, a sure, solid footing with you, that we can come before you, call on your name at any time, know you hear us, and mutually encourage each other in the faith. Thank you for your forgiveness of sins through your son, Jesus Christ, your word, your sacraments. These things continue to save us. They are eternal things. They are a complete gift from you. And we thank you that you've given them to us and that they're delivered in and through your people. But Lord, there's many that are suffering right now, suffering from anxiety, suffering from a lack of hope, an uncertain future, maybe joblessness, strained relationship, sickness, even death. So I just want to lift up all those who are, are suffering in mind, body, and spirit, and I'm just going to have a moment of silence so that all of us could just think of those people by name right now. Heavenly Father, I also want to pray for the church on earth and the church that is being persecuted. We're well aware of places in this world where your gospel cannot be proclaimed freely, that there is danger of death and harm for those who, who proclaim your name and those missionaries who are out doing that work, that you would watch over them, that you would guard them from the evil one, guard them from people who would cause them harm because they're telling the truth. They're telling the world about you and that there's a hope beyond the suffering of this planet and of our lives, that there is a, a hope in your son, Jesus Christ. So I just pray that your angels would guard them and protect them and give them the opportunities to proclaim you. I also want to lift up all those people who are, who are called in their various vocations to put their lives on the line, They're those first responders and doctors and nurses, people who care for those who cannot care for themselves, that they're selflessly giving them themselves. I want to pray for those leaders who are guiding these policies and, and ways that we should go about to prevent the spread of the coronavirus, that uh, people would be in homes safe, and that those that have the illness would be cared for. Pray for the, the church as it becomes a witness during this time. It is all too real that there's something wrong with us and the world and that we have a hope and a salvation and a resurrection beyond this. And lastly, I want to pray for those who are lost. And I mean those who are lost as in they're going through the wide path that leads to destruction. They're lost in their sin and they, they have not found you yet. They have not repented and believed in you and had eternal life. I want to pray for those that, that might be seeking, seeking you, seeking a hope that there might be opportunities for us to witness to them. We lift all these prayers in your Son's name, Jesus, who's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for praying with me. And right now, uh, we're going to go through a, a confession of forgiveness. Uh, this is more of a free flow style that I like. Um, the idea of, of coming to God and just agreeing with Him that we are sinners in need of a Savior. To be able to confess those things that, well, that may be burdening you, burdening me. Because whenever I sin, it's not just against my neighbor, it's against God, and it hurts my relationships. It hurts my relationship with God, it hurts my relationship with even the ones I love. So this is an opportunity for us, even through the internet, <laughs> for me to speak those wonderful words of forgiveness. So I'm gonna just have a silent time of, of confession for myself, and I wanna invite you to do the same. So I'll begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, go through for, uh, forgiveness. Dear Lord, just come before you tonight. I've been burdened, and I've been very anxious lately. I have not been trusting in you. It's been apparent I've got a lot of false gods in my life. That I haven't leaned on you. I've tried to lean on my own understanding, my own abilities. And I've been anxious and fearful, and it points to my sinful nature. I've many of the things that I've said and done. I've lost my temper, I've said things I shouldn't have, I've thought things I shouldn't, and I'm sorry. So I'm just going to be silent right now and let everybody else have time to just confess those specific things that you know are not supposed to be in the life of a Christian and come to your loving Father that wants it to be left at the cross. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the, the wonderful gift of forgiveness of sins that only comes through Jesus Christ's blood that was spilled on the cross to atone for your sins and my sins. That wonderful gift of forgiveness that can be proclaimed, that anyone can repent and believe in the one true God and have this thing they could never do for themselves, which is be forgiven, be free. So I'm called and ordained here at Living Faith and wherever you're at right now, uh, I can convey God's words from my lips to you. And he's called me to say these things on his behalf. I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So tonight our text comes from Luke chapter 15. It's the story of the prodigal son. I'm going to go ahead and read verses 11 through 32. And while I'm doing this, I would actually like to encourage everybody where you're at to pull out your Bibles. If it's got a Bible app, uh, if you've got one at home, uh, go ahead and send somebody to go get it. Because um, it, I think it'd be good for you to, to have these words uh, in front of you when I reference them. I have a few other scriptures, but uh, if you can get a Bible right now, that would be wonderful. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, the parable of the prodigal son. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of your of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent in him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs had ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was a still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put it on a ring Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when, his son, but when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead, and he is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. So grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So the story of the prodigal son is a very familiar one, very familiar to Christians, but it's even a story that's very familiar to those that may not be of the faith. It's, it's a wonderful story. It's the, it's the comeback. It's the redemption. It's the beautiful story of God's unconditional love for us. And many people read this story and they'll, they'll think, uh, well, what role would I, would I have in this story? Would I be uh, the prodigal son or the, the brother or the servants? Or... But this story really isn't necessarily about all of those things. It's actually a story of something being lost and then being found. I think it shows us that the prodigal son is uh, someone that many people that I've talked to think they consider themselves to be the prodigal son. And it's not about really sinning, confessing and being forgiven, which is what we just did. A lot of people think, oh, that's a prodigal son situation. I, I sinned, I repented, and God willingly takes me back. The story is way beyond that. Those of you who are of faith are not lost. This is a story of someone who was of faith, was with the Father, left the Father, and now has returned. It's a story of coming back to the faith. So this idea of Losing your faith is not a comfortable one. Unfortunately, there's a lot of teachings out that say, once you're saved, you're always saved. Scripture's clear that this is not the case. There's lots of situations where we see people who have faith and lose it, and probably most of you know someone who's in this situation. So before we get into that really deep and hard topic about losing your faith and the opportunity to be restored, well, let's talk about body basics. So this body basics sermon series is about ways to listen to God, uh, how to discipline ourselves. Body basics is something we teach little kids to help control their, their, their bodies and their posture, to be a good listener, uh, you know, from calming their hands to looking forward uh, to uh, calming their mouth. But this body basics is about feet. And Luke did a wonderful job on Sunday of talking about uh, where your feet are planted, the solid foundation that you start from. And if that solid foundation is not on the one true God, you're on a slippery, footloose <laughs> slope. And I think it was very appropriate to say, um, if we're not there, and the coronavirus has made all of us probably aware that we can never fulfill that first commandment. First commandment is to fear and love and trust in God above all things. No other gods. But as soon as some of our comforts and our anxieties and fears come to life, 
is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough for you? Is Jesus enough for me? And the answer for me was, I had weak faith. I struggled. I had anxiety and fears. God tells me not to be fearful, not to be anxious, but there I was. <laughs> the fearful, anxious pastor. And I still am struggling with it. But it just shows that nobody can really fulfill that first commandment. Nobody can have really no other gods. But the beautiful gift that Luke illustrated is that this pandemic has, well, brought a mirror on us to make us realize that there's something wrong with the world, there's something wrong with us, and no one's gonna deny it at this point. And everybody has some level of fear and anxiety with this. And unfortunately, that's normal. We're human. So, this idea of standing on solid ground, I'm gonna take what Luke talked about and take it one step further. And he spoke about this. Humans are doing beings. And the idea or the imagery is, is our walk. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. Disciples are followers of Jesus. And it comes from uh, Matthew um, 4.19, where we say our definition of being a disciple, uh, Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So what does that mean? A disciple is someone who's following Jesus, who's being transformed by Jesus, and is on mission with Jesus. This is the church. It's the Great Commission to baptize and teach in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus promises he's with us. This is the command of the church. We are to be following him. In, in fact, it's as we are going. All of us are going and moving and walking in a certain path. The question is, is it the right path? Are we following the right one? Now, this prodigal son thing, this text for tonight, it's funny how many Christians think they're the prodigal son. They think every time they sin or fall short, they're a prodigal and they need to be called back. I'm talking about people that I've spoken to. These are lifelong Christians, baptized, gone to church, confessed the faith until death, received word and sacrament, have never walked away from God, right? And then they're close to death and they'll say things like, boy, I hope I was good enough. I hope God says, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. I I've tried to live the best life I could. And it just shows all of us have a tendency to really think it's about me. <laughs> your salvation is not on your works. It's not about what you do. And that is a lie of the evil one who wants to make you think it is about that. And which is good to be reminded constantly it's not about being a good little boy or girl. It's about what Jesus Christ has done for you. And so when I'm in pastoral care of someone who's in that situation, it is a wonderful gift to remind them that your salvation and your getting to heaven has nothing to do with what you've done. It has everything to do with the work that Jesus Christ did on your behalf. The faith that you have is a gift. You are professing Christ. You are baptized. You believe. You have been given the path to walk. And that path is to heaven. And don't be fearful of this because if it does depend on you, you will not get there. But thanks be to God, it is because of what Christ has done for you. So even the lifelong, died in the wool LCMS Christian still needs to be reminded that it's not about works. What about this path? The path that leads to righteousness. What path should we walk? How do we get our feet on solid ground? And I'm going to go to another very familiar text, a very familiar text from Matthew 7, the golden rule. So whatever you wish, this is a Matthew 7, uh, 12 through 14, if you want to look. So uh, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now what's funny is the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have done to yourself. 
People who aren't even Christian will be like, yes, I've heard that one, right? It's a good, good teaching. Unfortunately, they actually think that's the gospel. <laughs> Do unto others as you would have done to you. That is not the gospel. That is complete law. It is command. And if you try to show that to yourself, you'll see how big a failure we all are because nobody does this perfectly. I'm not saying it's bad. It's great. It's a beautiful, good teaching, but it is not what saves you. But this idea of the gate, this makes people a little bit nervous too. If I'm supposed to be walking this hard, narrow path, the path of a disciple, the path of Jesus, I don't do that very well. And it says right here, the gate is wide and open and leads to destruction. So the idea of this wide open gate, this is the default. This is where we're all headed. I don't have to convince any of you, hey, uh, sin, you're going to do it, right? It's you're born into sin. You are destined for destruction unless you are saved from that. Everyone is born broken. Uh, we all have this virus called sin. And it makes the coronavirus look like child's play. Because we're not talking about an illness that leads to bodily death. We're talking about eternal death. That is the wide open gate. It's the wide and easy path. But there's this narrow way, this narrow way of salvation. And that gate has to be shown to us. It has to be revealed to us. It has to be given to us. This is the gospel. This is the way out of the wide open path to destruction. This is the path to eternal life. And that pathway is hard. It is a pathway of perfection. It is a pathway that demands that we leave all of these things behind and go to the Father. And that path is only blazed by Jesus Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are following him on the narrow path. And that narrow path leads to life, to righteousness, to holiness. And it's not because you are, it's because he is. You are joined with his life, death, and resurrection in your baptisms. You are one with him, and you are following him, and it doesn't have to wait till you die. You are right now in the kingdom. You are on the narrow, hard path. And why is it hard? Because what are you promised? You are promised persecution. You're promised that there's going to be trials and tribulations. But God is with you till the end of the age. And uh, one of my commentaries about this this uh, narrow gate. It says, contrition, faith, and a Christian life are like a narrow portal and passage. We cannot ride into, or into it with our sin, self-righteousness, false notions, vices, and follies. We could not even get them through the portal. The broad portal and the spacious passage are different. There are many cart in anything we please. More than an abundant room invites us to do so. But this portal and passage lead to destruction. But the fact that such a portal exists that saves you from that wide one is amazing. It also says, but suddenly there is before our eyes. This, this portal opens up. There's a way out. There is a way to be saved, a salvation. This finding is not accomplished in any search of ours. It is holy by the grace of him who places the portal before us. This is the portal to heaven and to eternal life. This is the path of all Christians. Now this good news of the gospel, it is open to all who repent and believe, but there's still several that don't even want to see it or cannot see it. Now this idea of the prodigal son, maybe you know personally someone who has been that prodigal, someone who believed one day, professed Christ, and now they don't. I just had a... Uh, a recent uh, situation, I, our family was one of the crazy families that went on a spring break trip. And when I, we were there, I uh, were sitting by the pool and a couple young college kids were there, Riley and Jordan. And uh, they find out I'm a pastor. They say, oh, well, we've got some questions for you. So I'm like, all right, let's do it. I find out Riley is from the University of Kentucky. Uh, he's got a really cool student, uh, work study job. He gets to work at Rupp Arena and he knows uh, John Calipari. So he sees him all the time, had some funny stories about him. Uh, he's a believer. 
Uh, I, I, from what I could tell, he grew up, grew up probably in a Baptist or Holiness church. And then uh, Jordan is uh, from Clemson University, and he uh, was an architect, very smart young man, uh, very articulate. Uh, but he told me that he grew up in the faith, but he no longer believes it. He says he's got friends and family and his grandma and his mom and dad who are constantly encouraging him to come back. But he's like, I have lots of doubts. And yeah, I have lots of doubts about scripture, right? the validity of it, the accuracy of it. Is this really uh, the way it is? And is this the only way to be saved? And so he's, he's asking me all these questions. So here we go. I, I'm sitting, there's this probably prodigal son sitting right in front of me. This young man who's walked away from the faith. And I told him, I'm like, I get it. I was that guy when I was your age too. I was not walking with the Lord. I, I wanted to doubt and question everything. I, I wanted to be in control instead of God. and That's normal. <laughs> I told him that your ability to believe doesn't even come for yourself. It's a gift from God. And the fact that you have people around you that love you who are trying to save you from that path of destruction to the one way to true life is a testimony to the people around you that they love you, that they want to be in heaven with you. Now, obviously, when I worked, when I got to talk to him, I asked a few questions, which is usually a good thing to do. So I asked Riley, the believer, I go, Riley, how, what's the one unforgivable sin, Riley? And of course, Riley is <laughs> maybe not the best theologian. He goes, well, I can think of three or four. I'm like, well, yeah, you're whole, probably won't grow up in a holiness church. <laughs> so he probably thinks there's, you know, like dancing, you go to hell or something. I don't know. But I was like, okay, Riley, here's the deal. There's only one unforgivable sin. And that is unbelief. The blaspheme of the Holy Spirit. I go, are you doing that? He goes, no. I go, are you baptized? Yes. Do you believe? Yes. I go, well, here's the beautiful gift you've been given. And here's who you are in Christ. And here is the gospel. That Jesus Christ died for you. And if you believe that he rose on the third day, that you're joined with him, that you too will rise on the last day, and that you are safe and secure, you're on the narrow path, right? Of course, Jordan's sitting there hearing me say this to him. And Jordan doesn't want to believe it. Very congenial, nice man, very open, honest. But it was kind of ended with that. I just got to tell him, well, here's the deal. Here's what you used to believe. Here's the good news that you too can be saved and that nothing you do can separate. No sin is too great that God won't forgive. He does not put a condition on his love. Now, I remember I was walking away from the pool deck and I saw him one last time. And I said, Jordan, I just got one more thing to say to you. God loves you. And that's really what the story of the prodigal son is. It's a story of love, unconditional love, a love that would send his one and only son to die on the behalf of all of us so that we can find that narrow path to him. And we're going there. The question is, do the people we know, are they going there? So these pandemics, <laughs> this is not the first pandemic in history. In fact, uh, one of the books we had to read in seminary talks about three really large pandemics that uh, devastated the Roman world. Now, pandemics are awful. There's lots of death and suffering and they're horrible and they're definitely a testimony to the fall. But what's interesting is sociologists have found that these three huge pandemics in the Roman world led to a very rapid rise in Christianity. Why? Well, the ethic of the day, Plato and Aristotle said, if there's a pandemic in your town, get out, leave them to die. The Christians were like, um, I'm already going to live forever. This body doesn't matter. I'm going to stay here and not take care of them. That's, that's cool. I got eternal life. And what they found out was, uh, the survival rates went up tremendously for those who were actually cared for by the Christians. And then what do you think happened with those people who survived and were cared for by Christians? They repented, they got baptized, they believed. And then all the people came back to town and they're like, I want what they got. 
And this happened three times in the percentage of, and then obviously the survival rate, unfortunately, for areas where there wasn't Christians, was much higher, was, uh, the death rate was much higher. I know these are awful, real circumstances, but the truth is, pretty much every pandemic has grown the church. So here's our opportunity, Christians, to be a witness to the world that you have nothing to fear. Your life is not your own. You have the promise of eternal life. You have been given this wonderful gift. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't use this time to just survive. Use it to profess Jesus Christ. And when you uh, receive the benediction, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon with favor and give you his peace. Have a wonderful rest of the week.